What would you do if you had one day left to live? If I were to answer that question, I'd say I'd spend the time with my husband, Jonathan. Maybe we'd sit in the backyard of our house that we built together and drink coffee together one last time. But there's one other thing I would do. I would create this video, this one, the one you're watching now. Because when the bombs drop, I would want there to be a record that we got this far. Edificare pugnare ut pugnare edificabo. Mars was the Roman god of war. Mars was also allegedly the father of Romulus, the founder of Rome, thus the pater of the Roman people, the father of the Roman people. Like Athena was born from the brow of Zeus without a mother, Mars in the Roman pantheon was born from the goddess Juno without a father. You might notice a little something familiar about all of this. Just like in the Greek pantheon, Mars was also the lover of Venus, goddess of love. And during the Renaissance revival in Italy, it was observed that Mars never dominated Venus, she always dominated him. This is important to note for later. In the Roman pantheon, Mars assumed a characteristic distinct from his Greek ancestor Ares. Mars was not just a god of war, Mars was the god of destruction, the protector of soldiers, and the guardian of farmers. Mars was also the god of peace and agriculture. This was part of the weaponry issued to every Roman legionnaire. The majority of the Roman expansion was during the Republic period, when all citizen men were conscripted into the army, and Rome was a state of citizen smallholders. During this time, they felled enemies and forests alike, creating drainage schemes, building aqueducts, dividing the conquered land into parcels, which were often granted to veterans for rewards for service. They fought the way you farm a field. No emphasis on glory or individual heroics, no tall warriors and bright battle paint whooping war cries, but discipline, cooperation, and efficiency. You fought as a unit, you built as a unit, and your job wasn't done clearing the land. You had to cultivate it afterward, too. They laid down their roads and aqueducts through miles and miles of countryside like they were irrigating the field the sides of a continent. The face of Italy was changed, and the cycle of conquest, annexation, and settlement continued until they had conquered all, almost all, of continental Western Europe and parts of the Mediterranean. The Romans cultivated the land, their land, on a vast scale. No longer did the state keep itself mostly confined wall behind walls, only going out to fight wars and extract tribute. Now the state extended itself throughout the land, marking ownership and making the country part of itself. And they did that using their roads. A Bronze Age farmer who had never known a proper road could pull his produce to market on the stone roads of Rome. The scale of all of that might have compelled our Bronze Age farmer to want to be part of something so vast, so powerful, and yet in some ways so very humble. That Bronze Age farmer might have heard incredible stories about those Bronze Age city-states and their majestic palaces, but instead of building a great monument to its own majesty within its walls that he only heard about in traveler's tales, Rome also built a road past your house. So your produce came to the market clean and fresh. Sure, you want your army to be able to march anywhere. You want to be able to move goods quickly through your lands and information too. You want to inspire and intimidate with the scale of your building projects and your infrastructure and make those projects tangible to your subject populations. But you also want to make sure produce comes to the market clean and fresh. <laughs> Romans were farmers who conquered the world because they knew one simple fact. Owning the land is more than just clearing it. You have to cultivate it to truly own it. That's a new relationship between the land and the state. Rome was the first true nation, not a city-state, a nation, a true country. The Roman Mars was a god of war with a completely unique relationship to the land. He didn't just want to conquer it, he wanted to cultivate it. Mars represented the union between the shovel and the sword the union of builders and fighters. But where did that cooperation between two very different groups of men, the soldier and the farmer, come from? The dominant man that protects and the disciplined man that provides. 
How did they become unified in one man, one deity, in Mars? How did Rome create countrymen? There's another element in Roman statecraft. Going back to the story of Romulus, after the argument over the which of the seven hills to found Rome on, Romulus killed his brother Remus. But Romulus had bigger problems. The landless refugees that had come to Rome were mostly male. Rome needed women. So Romulus concocted a scheme to hold a festival and steal the women of the neighboring Sabine tribe to become Roman wives. The plan was successful. The Roman men fought off the Sabine men to claim the Sabine women as their own. Gynocentrism is a name given to the observation that women constitute the center of a family, a tribe, a nation. They decide who is within and who is without by virtue of being our first model of what is human, as our mothers. They teach children who belong to they belong to, what standard they march under, and who they march against. Women beat the drums of war. You can see this all over the world, from the Middle East to 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 I to Women beat the drums of war, and you can see this all over the world, from the Middle East to Ireland. They keep the animities, they keep the grudges alive from generation to generation. They are responsible for treating, for teaching their children who to hate. Recognition of this is why many ancient societies gave war a woman's face. When Bronze Age statecraft broke to pieces in the face of Iron Age technology because tribes were once again so evenly matched and centers, centers of power lost control, we lapsed back into organizing around primitive gynocentrism, primitive tribalism. Those men over there could put their penises in our women, or those, mare over, those men over there did put their penises in our women, or simply, there are penises out there that aren't being controlled. This lapse into primitive gynocentrism, this dark age where technology outpaces statecraft, should feel pretty familiar to everyone listening. In response to the Romans stealing their daughters and sisters, the Sabine men raised a war party and prepared to liberate their women and destroy Rome. I can imagine what the Roman men must have felt seeing the Sabine war party descending upon them. After all, even if the Roman men had courted the Sabine women, as was suggested in the stories, and gotten their consent, they still failed to get the consent of their fathers and thus dishonored him, not to mention the kidnapping. The Roman men had to know they had it coming. The Sabine men were going to kill them for, well, putting their penises in Sabine women. <laughs> But guilt didn't matter because the Roman men were facing down a fight to the death over the honor of the Sabine women. Imagine during that time there must have been similar scenes played out through all the world. Women choosing to wait out the fight and go home with whoever won. Women who'd been kidnapped. Just choosing uh, whichever group of men. They chose to allow the conflict over their honor to reach its inevitable conclusion in one or the other tribe of men dead. It was also the route that either avenged their honor, if their father's tribe won, or erased their dishonor, if their husband's tribe won. Yay! Win-win! And the Sabine women were initially no different. They took the safe route, staying out of the conflict, accepting the outcome, also preserved the Sabine women's standing as something to be fought to the death over. It was the route of least resistance, the path of the damsel, the victim, the wronged woman. Incidentally, that seems to be the feminist approach as well. Let men destroy each other's lives, rights, and reputations over the issue of what penis went where. The battle was fierce, but just when the Roman men appeared to be winning, the Sabine women rushed the battlefield and threw themselves between the swords of the Roman and Sabine men. As they did so, they said, since we are the source of your conflict, kill us instead of each other. Now, I imagine it's quite hard to turn a fatal sword thrust when you're in the middle of fighting for your life, so I wonder how many Sabine women actually did lose their lives rushing that battlefield. Kill us instead of each other. The Sabine women weren't just ending a war. They were challenging the primitive tribalism that gripped the early Iron Age. They challenged the idea that men's lives should be spent avenging the honor, their honor, women's honor, or erasing women's dishonor. In that moment, as men on both sides dropped their swords, and the Sabine women repudiated their traditional gynocentric privilege of being fought over, they forged a shared Roman identity. 
The story may be a myth, but it was a story Roman women told themselves about the virtues they wanted to embody. The real battle was over the children of the Sabine women and the Roman men. Would those children be Sabine by birth or Roman by law? The sacrifice of the Sabine women enabled them to be both. Remember Helen of Troy? The Greek city-states had all the ingredients of Roman statecraft, and yet they never stopped warring with each other. They had all the ingredients except one. Instead of being put to death, the Sabine men were given the hill they took during the fight to free their daughters, and they became Roman citizens. And the Roman and Sabine men had to learn to cooperate and work together. This is the mythic source of later Roman statecraft. A man could become a citizen of Rome by law and not birth. This simple idea was original to Rome and the foundation of its success in not just conquering, but Romanizing Europe and the Mediterranean. It lay the foundation for a shared legal identity between men that superseded the tribal identity of birth. Men who were before tribesmen at each other's throats over the honor of their women were now countrymen united under the law. Now there could be peace between tribes of men. Now soldiers could lay down their swords and pick up shovels and build together. This was the statecraft that Hellenistic Greece lacked. Within the context of the overarching Roman identity, there was always competition, deadly rivalry, but each one of those rivals would have said, we are both Roman. The Sabine women used gynocentrism as they rejected it. They used the fact that the Roman and Sabine men would not kill them to stop them killing each other. In the process, the Sabine women forged the Roman identity, which inspired people of all ethnicities, races, nationalities, to regard themselves as having a shared Romanness that still somehow inspires us today and leads us to write our mottos in Latin. Edificare, paniare, ut paniare ne edificabo. One stupendous moment of compassion by the Sabine women towards the two tribes of men fighting over them, founding a statecraft we still use to this day. <laughs> Female inferiority? I don't think so. You can't have an empire that's constantly at war with equally armed provinces. You have to inspire them to want to be part of a greater whole, and you do that with a truly shared identity. So if you're going to tell me gynocentrism can't be challenged, maybe you're right. But it sure as hell can be channeled, and it can be used just like any other instinct to destroy or to build. In the union of the Sabine and the Roman, you see the cooperative union of the shovel and the sword, the union between the army and the land, the birth of a true Iron Age statecraft. That was the key, the Iron Age statecraft to contend with Iron Age technology, which, incidentally, was unbeatable. Edificare, pugnare, pugnare, nedificabo. It means fight to build, build to fight. I'm not a feminine woman by any stretch of the imagination. I have difficulty damseling. I'm short and have huge feet and hands and broad shoulders. I'm angry, bossy, difficult cunt. But I know now what makes me feminine is my compassion for men. And it's also what makes me powerful as a woman. Where women have no compassion for the plight of men, there is war and strife. Where they do, there is cooperation and civilization. We worship women's compassion not because there is more of it, because let's be frank, there isn't, but because of how powerful it is. I wonder if that's why the ancients created goddesses of war who are also often goddesses of love. Now, if you want to know why everything is going to shit, and by shit I mean everything that we talk about here on Honey Badger Radio, the answer is simple. We have space age technology, but we have only have iron age statecraft. At that point, it's actually more like, I mean, at this point, it's actually more like rust age statecraft. As much as we try to patch it, it's still breaking apart at the seams. We're in exactly the situation we were in during the dark ages after the fall of those bronze age city-states. Our technology has outpaced our statecraft and we've des descended into a psychotic and unsustainable tribal madness. The men's issues that we talk about are where our society has lapsed into a primitive gynocentrism that is tearing apart our Iron Age statecraft and metaphorically calls for men to be sacrificed for women's honor and benefit, or rather what the dominant ideology considers women's honor and benefit. Now, if I'm right about this, 
If Rome became a world power because of its roads, and those roads only happened because of its Iron Age statecraft, its Iron Age statecraft was a result of greater cooperation between Roman men, and that only happened because of a shared identity and shared sense of purpose, and that identity was founded by the compassion of a few dozen women who threw themselves on the swords of men who were ready to kill and die for them. If I'm right, as women, our compassion brought Iron Age statecraft into the Iron Age. Our compassion for men forged an empire that brought the world together. Then it's possible, just maybe, that another act of compassion by women towards men will heal the lines of conflict we see around us and create the foundation of a new cooperative relationship between men, a new statecraft, a space age statecraft for space age technology. And that's how men's rights is a hidden gem. Not just any gem, the lithium crystals. Now, if I were a man, or maybe a woman on top of this mountain, uh, this modern Iron Age mountain, this modern Iron Age mountain of statecraft, of Iron Age statecraft, I might be tempted to stop the future from coming, stop my little Iron Age mountain from being turned into a space age molehill. And if I were that man or woman on top of the mountain, I might see a little further than other people and realize that the best way to stop the future from rolling on by would be to teach generation after generation of little girls that they are society's victims. Not society's founders, not smiths, cra smiths of statecraft, but weak, pathetic little victims of society constantly crushed by forces beyond their control. They're women eternally in the state of being wronged by men. After all, if you can't take someone's power away, you can always convince them that they don't have it. Of course, if this is too conspiratorial, we are a species that managed to spontaneously domesticate itself, so maybe all of this is purely subconscious, teaching little girls that they're victims in order to prevent them from discovering their power is purely subconscious. Still, it's interesting that the powers that be choose to teach girls that they are victims of men since you don't feel compassion when you're a victim. It's easy to manipulate women's insecurities when we see men's accomplishments and we feel small and insignificant. It's easy to cling to the belief instead that of being less, we're wronged. We're all wronged women, right? And wronged women deserve to see men dead and punished to avenge their dishonor. But ladies, do you really want to be, continue to be manipulated by the powers that be into seeing yourselves as small, as put upon, as victims? Or do you want to recognize your true power? Not a weasel word like empowerment. Power. Your true power as a woman. Compassion for men. And what would happen if women just kept giving compassion? We just kept laying the foundation for greater and greater cooperation between men with each technological revolution. In our society, a well-behaved woman serves the man on the mountain by being seen as a damsel to be saved. She might be a strident victim, an angry victim, a weepy victim, a weepy victim. But at the end of the day, she plays the victim, the woman wronged, the woman who deserves to take from the men who've dishonored her and never give, never give a thing, certainly not compassion. In our society, a well-behaved woman plays the victim. Well, I aim to misbehave. We're at the end of the cycle of Iron Age statecraft. We're at the end of another grand cycle as well, but that's a story for another day. I don't know where that road will take us. I don't know what space age statecraft will look like, at least not entirely. It's praxis. We don't know the answer until we do the answer. But I do know that the first step is compassion for men, and the second step, and the third, and on and on. Which is why the Iron Age anachronisms that seek to rule us fear it. They fear women's true power. So let's take another step. Let's build based on compassion for men and respect for the power of women. Let's build our new world.
guys, so we seem to have found a, a muskrat on the highway. Run! Hey bud, get off the highway! Out! Yeah, go back into your territory, come on. Go! There we go.